Connor Walton, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Thank you for having me on, Jeff. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So, you're from Ireland, <laughs> and it were yes, you? Yeah, uh... I'm, I'm, I'm from Ireland. Um, uh, yes, the Republic of Ireland, not Britain. Right. Um, <laughs> for all those so... listening, I'll just say. <laughs> This is our second time recording, and I told him he was from Britain before, and I noticed um, visible offense on his face. So <laughs> we, we won't get into that. But so you're definitely oh, from really, Ireland. I'm not really offended. I'm not really offended, but I at least have to act like I'm offended. Oh, good, good. Okay, I get it. <laughs> well, all right. So you were born and raised there, I understand. Yes, I'm originally from Dublin, and now I'm living uh, a bit south of Dublin in a town called Arklow, which was originally founded by the Vikings. Uh, there are a few sort of old Viking settlements along the the Irish coast, and this is one of them. Oh, no kidding! So does that mean you come from the Vikings then, or are you you have Scandinavian blood in you? Oh, I I don't know. I've never done a genetic uh test uh so i i i've no uh idea really i know i i know there's some uh british blood in there mm. um i the, the 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 walton name is a norman name um and they were settled down in in, in kilkenny but my grandfather was adopted by the waltons so uh. there's, there's not a bloodline going back to them but beyond, but beyond that, you know, we're 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 sort of a, a you know, a, a mongrel Celtic nation um, with with a, a good amount of DNA that that was that's pre-Celtic, you know, that goes back to the Neolithic. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did a DNA test recently, and apparently, I'm half Scandinavian, half British. So we might be brothers. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well. Well, so, we're all brothers. We're you know? all brothers, we're right? All brothers. We're all brothers. Well, tell me a little bit about your past. How did you um, get into art, and have you always been interested in it? Uh, well, I, I was always interested in drawing. I wasn't always interested in art, uh, but I was always interested in making images. And I think like a lot of kids, they, make, they, they paint, they uh, make pictures. And uh, and I just kept going, you know. I think most kids make images, and and some uh, or most stop, and some keep going. You know, you get a positive feedback loop going, and you you get you make progress, you get praise for what you're doing, and think, oh, this is good. Mm hmm. So when did that go from just an interest to a profession? How did you make that transition, and why did you make that transition? Um, I, I, you know, I was, I was developing skills. I was developing observational skills. And at a certain point I thought, could I earn a living from it? Could I be a comic strip artist? You know, at a certain point I was big into comics. You know, I used to read 2000 AD and, um, a lot of the sci-fi stuff. And I wanted to, could, could I be a comic strip artist? Like I used to, uh, my, my, my sister who went to art college used to bring home, um, books of drawings, you know, some of them by the Renaissance masters. And I, rem I remember taking a, a book of Michelangelo's figure drawings and sort of putting capes and uh, tights and, and uh, superhero outfits uh, on them, you know, which was sort of interesting, you know, sort of, you know, all these action poses from the uh, the Battle of Cassina and uh, the the uh, the last judgment turned turned into science fiction. <laughs> um, so it wasn't a bad way of learning anatomy and 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 uh, you know Renaissance drawing style. Well, that doesn't surprise but, me because you still so, sort of do funny continued. things like that. You have uh, you have a lot of humor in yeah. your art. I feel like. Well, it's it's not intended to be humor. I'm just a bit crazy, you know. I'm, just, <laughs> I, I, I'm a bit perverse. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I want to hear more about that. Why, you know, where the, 
what your actual intentions are when we get to the art. But um, so how old were you about when your sister brought home those books and you started thinking about painting as a career? I think I was about 10 or 11. Uh, she's 13 years older than me. So that's probably when she would have been starting art college. And, uh, and, and then I sort of, I, I was really mostly looking at Renaissance art and stuff like that. That was what took my interest at, at the time. I, I was pretty much totally unaware of uh, 20th century art and all of that sort of thing. Hmm. So did you end up going to art college yourself? I did. Um, uh, my parents weren't crazy about the idea, but I um, I decided I was going to give it a go, and they backed me uh, rather reluctantly, I suppose, to begin with. And uh, I uh, I made a go of it. Um, I'm I'm the youngest seven, mm. so and I and I come like I'm I'm 17 years younger than my eldest brother. So I, I sort of came a long way behind and, uh, uh, you know, I, I was I was sort of careful in my rebellion because I saw a lot of my older siblings' rebellions uh, sort of misfire and, and they, they sort of rude uh, some of their uh, more radical decisions. So I, I was determined that I was going to be a, 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 a success, you know, and I was going to uh, go about things the right way, um, going to art college and I was going to be, you know, I was going to work very hard and, um, you know, prove my parents wrong and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but you know, in, in some ways it worked out in some ways it didn't. So what was your parents hesitation or reluctance to have you go there? Well, it, it was partly, uh, my sister's experience of art college was, uh, not very happy. She was going through in the late 70s, early 80s to begin with, and it was a period of upheaval in the college. You know, the the, ex, the expressionists were were coming in and sort of shaking things up and and, and emasculating the traditionalists and the old timers. And she found it a, a difficult environment, and she found a lot of the critique very uh, um, negative. I think that's a common enough experience of people going to art college that, you know, that they, they, they get these crits which uh, are, are sometimes difficult to recover from. And so uh, she sort of dropped out of art college at a certain point. Um, but the other thing was, you know, my parents sort of said, well, how do you earn a living as a painter? And, you know, my father was, you know, aware rightly that, it wasn't easy to earn a living for, as a painter and he knew struggling artists, you know, and sometimes he bought their work out of a sense of charity, you know, rather than um, because he really admired them, you know, as sort of, you know, artists coming, you know, knocking to his, you know, knocking at his door saying, can you buy my work, please? You know, I'm hungry. So he sometimes did that and oh. he didn't want me to be like that. Um, but uh, you know, obviously he, he knew that I had some talent and it was just a question of whether I had what it took to, to make it. Hmm. So what so gave you the confidence? I had it, of course. What gave you the confidence with your sister having well, a bad experience, your parents telling you you can't do it or no one can do it? Um, what gave you the guts? I was just like, you know, most teenagers have guts. Most teenagers believe that they're gods, you know? So <laughs> I, I, I had full confidence in myself, uh, just out of pure delusion, really. Uh, just not knowing how art college works, not knowing anything, not really knowing about uh, art, you know, at that point. Uh, you know, I knew, I knew about the Renaissance, I knew about the old masters and stuff like that, but I didn't, I had no idea what had happened, you know, sort of the 20th century revolution. I, I hadn't sort of assimilated that at all. Uh, my family were a sort of a classic, you know, middle class, conservative uh, family with tr very traditional taste in art. And that was what I sort of imbibed and thought to be normal. And so, you know, going to art college and discovering, you know, conceptualism and stuff like that was a bit of a shock. Was it a positive shock? I mean, how did you receive it? I think it was a positive shock ultimately, 
But uh, my initial response was that, you know, a, a lot of this was bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have any time for it. And uh, I I got a, a reputation in the college as someone who was, you know, sort of a classic reactionary, you know. Uh, like the, the, the old timers that there was um, a, an Irish painter called Sean Keating, who was a, a student of William Orpen, uh, ran the, the art college up until the 1970s. And he was sort of a, Sort of a diehard traditionalist figurative artist, and and uh, a lot of the younger generation rebelled against his influence. Uh, but I, you know, when I came in in the late eighties, it was like the revenge of Sean Keating. You know, as far as as far as the, my teachers were concerned, they just saw me as as you know the the son of Sean Keating, the 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 illegitimate grandson of Sean Keating. You know, with horns. Hmm. So they that there was there was a mutual antipathy. But it, it, in the in the late eighties, I think it was an interesting period in that there were still some of the old timers. There were still traditionally trained painters, uh, you know, who went who were taught back in the sixties. Uh, they were still around, and then you had the you know uh, expressionists and abstract artists and postmodernists, and uh, you know th- th- there was a lot of diversity, and. Um, I did benefit from that and from the, you know, the the exchange of ideas, the questioning of ideas, and uh, you know, the lack of respect that everyone had for everyone else, basically, because you know, the the the, the postmodernists despised the expressionists, and uh, you know, they thought they they were just stupid romantics, and the the expressionists, you know despised the traditionalists and, and the postmodernists to some extent. So it was all this antipathy and you got all this sort of argument of people sort of, you know, dissing each other's work, um, which was interesting. <laughs> That's a really positive way to describe it. Interesting. So why do you feel like it was positive for you? Because you're not, you're, you're traditionalist in a sense. I mean, you have contemporary um taste I mean, your, your work feels contemporary but your technique is very traditional so what do you feel like you took from an education with all that conceptual diversity well i am I'm, I'm only half a traditionalist um uh, uh, and i don't uh I don't go along with a lot of the conservative reactionary rhetoric that tends to dominate the uh, the representational art scene, particularly in 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 the U.S. You know, uh, I think particularly you know vehement the sort of you know make painting great again uh, uh, narrative. Um, uh, so I, I I actually feel I. You know, I took from both sides. I was very interested in technique, um, uh, and my frustration with the the modernists was that they wouldn't teach technique, and they yeah. had these ideas that technique was was um, bad. You know, it was it 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 was um, you know empty virtuosity, and it destroyed your authenticity. You know, and it was better to sort of make these sort of primitive. Uh, gestures than to do anything refined, and that really annoyed me. And the fact that they that you know even the ones who had been taught techniques uh, wouldn't teach them, refused to teach them, like it's bad for you. Like I have it, you know, mm. I was taught it and it did me harm. So I'm not going to do. I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, and that annoyed me. So um, I wanted. The, the 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 techniques I wanted skills, but I also wanted uh, the freedom to do what I wanted with them and not be bound to um, uh, an aesthetic or an ideology. Uh, and and I found it like after I went to art college, um, first of all I went off and did a master's in art history, which sort of grounded me intellectually but then i went and studied painting in florence under charles Cecil, and that was sort of very much the old atelier uh 
an attempt at the atelier system. It wasn't very authentic, but but that was the notion that you know we are teaching traditional skills and techniques. Uh, but they they wanted to indoctrinate you at the same time. You know they wanted to uh, turn you away from modernism and um, uh, you know basically convert you to their 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 um, you know, it's like the Native Americans on the reservation. You know, like you had to you had to go along with the the you know all all the superstitious you know clap trap that went with their techniques. And I uh, argued against that. Basically, I thought that a lot of what they were teaching was uh, <laughs> I love it. So so you thought you thought a lot of what was being taught at the university as baloney and then you think a lot of the stuff at the atelier is baloney <laughs> i like it because i can see it in your work you're very well rounded you it, it, it you you really are your own person and it's clear to me as an observer that you have kind of pulled from everything so i can appreciate where you're coming from with that well, I think you know the, the 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 question in art college was you know is painting dead and uh, you know what the hell are you doing painting pictures in the late twentieth or early twenty first century whatever it is you know yeah. if you have to justify what you're doing it's not self evident that that what you're doing is valid and there was this notion of what valid. Uh, which was an argument that ran through art college, and you know maybe it continues to run through art college. Um, uh, and uh, on the traditionalist side, there was this view that modernism was fundamentally invalid, mm -hmm. and only only tradition was valid, only technique was valid. Uh, you know, modernist expression was not conceptualism was not, uh, uh, and there, there were huge blinkers around what visual culture represented. Now, the, the, both sides have blinkers to some extent because, you know, like if, I think if you look at what's really vibrant in visual culture today, it's in the movies and it's in photography and it's in television and it's all of this. And, you know, that's where a lot of people coming out of art college end up going, you know, because that's, that's where you will make money doing visual stuff. Uh, and it's not painting pictures. Um, but the 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 modernists tended to ignore all of that, you know, the, the 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 movies and the vibrant visual culture that we're all exposed to, and and the traditionalists tended to uh, do that as well. So uh, you know, I think you know often it, it, where painting has influence today, it's it's often filtered through the movies you know it's 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 often you know like artists like uh giger um you know who was influenced by francis bacon and whatever else you know coming up with alien and uh everything you know that that that's how the stuff filters out into popular consciousness it's not through people going and visiting museums yeah so i'm curious if you were to open a school and teach art what do you think your mission statement might be? <laughs> Is that too hard to answer on the spot? Um, I, I have thought about this. I don't do a lot of teaching. I yeah. do a bit. I, I have, I have, I set up a, a, a summer school uh, back in 2017. 2016, 2017, which, which ran for uh, a few years. Um, and, and they were like intensive courses, uh, and, uh, you know, like a week long, people would come and stay and, uh, it would be, you know, morning till night, uh, doing stuff, lots of food, lots of wine, lots of paint, um, uh, uh, and just, uh, uh, an immersion and basically try to blow people's minds that that was what, uh, I, I sought to do. Uh, and, um, you know, in some ways overload, 
people, but you know the the, the sort of experience that I, I you know I don't know when you've you know you've you've gone and and studied with some really talented artist, uh, you know for a, a week or a short period of time, you cannot assimilate what they've uh, they've shown you, you know, for years. You know, but the memory sticks there, and and maybe a couple of years after, you think, oh, you know, that was what the guy meant. I very much believe in that. There's a, a saying by Nietzsche, which is, you know, if you if you if you want to go if you don't want to go thirsty among men, you need to learn to drink out of all cups. Oh, that's a and if you want to mm. and if you want to stay clean among men. You have to learn how to wash even with dirty water. Hmm. I'll think about that one. So, That's deep. <laughs> so that was that was part of what I tried to do both with the uh the traditionalist and the avant gardist, which was basically to to extract some uh something usable from them but not the whole package. Well, like we're all, we're all messed up, you know, mm -hmm. like <laughs> yeah, I, I, most of the artists I've, I've met are oh. up people, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and as teachers, you know, they're, 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 they're like, they're bad parents, you know, um, you, you, you wouldn't want to live in their households because they're half crazy. And uh, you you have to sort of. Uh, I'm not going to let my kids and, and listen to, to this me one. As well, of course, yeah, <laughs> that goes for me as well. Um, yeah. But you 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 should you should approach these people with 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 some sense of you know the the you know wash your hands, put on sanitary, you know wear the mask maybe, uh, and certainly uh, you know when you when you step away, uh, be be. Be careful and try to to uh, manage the the influence, you know. And th there are very charismatic artists. Like you know, when I came across Art Nerdrum, for example, you know, I was just blown away by uh, the the man and his his charisma and his sort of the the cult that surrounded him. And uh, I was very impressed by that and uh i saw a lot of people like falling under his spell like literally they were mesmerized by him uh and i thought that was often not very healthy uh so i i think people you know like it, it, the, the old notion of influence you know it's like what where where artists are asked about their influences you know what's your influence and and influence you know, in Italian, it's influenza, uh, and the, the the notion is basically uh, of you know it can be a malign influence. You know, it can be you know the, the the original notion of influenza is you know it's influence of the stars or whatever. It's you fall sick because of something going on around you that's unhealthy, but they couldn't they didn't know that it was bacteria or whatever. So. And, and you had this this uh, situation even back in in the Renaissance, you know, where artists went to Rome and you know went into the Sistine Chapel, you know, in summertime, and it was too hot, it was malaria, they got sick. Uh, but then they looked at the Sistine Chapel and they got even sicker. You know, they were they were they were delirious and in every sense of the word, and went off and created these sort of over muscled, you know, strange. You know Michelangelo's caricatures, and that was sort of the you know malign artistic influenza. So uh, I think you have to watch out about about you know, and and it's it's always been the case. You have to watch out about these these uh, you know egoists and and artistic uh, personalities who 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 almost want cults around them. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So yeah, now I'm going to ask the dangerous question. You you know after you mentioned that about influences, can you name some influences of your own? Um, well, uh, I suppose Odd Nerdrum would be would be one uh, certainly. I paid a lot of attention uh, to his work uh, in in my uh, my formal education. You know, whatever I, my uh, my. 
uh, my tutor at art college was a painter um, called Kerry Clark, who's still alive. He's in his late 80s now, but he's still uh, going. And I, did, I don't really paint like him, but I learned from him. And, uh, and, and I liked his attitude, you know. So uh, there, there are people I, I picked up um, uh, ideas from along the way. And, um, wait, so tell me more about Odd Did you study with him for a period of time or did you just meet him? I was under the impression you only met him. I, I didn't study with him. I, I, I went and watched, Hmm. uh, I, I visited him in, in Norway and in Iceland and, uh, and then I, I I met him in New York when he was having one of his solo shows there. So I spent uh, a you know not very long in the scheme of things, uh, maybe a week in total with him. But uh, I I paid a lot of attention to what he was doing, and it is it, it had a big impact in the long term. But but his his work was had what had the bigger impact because before I met him, I'd, I'd come across his paintings and was obsessed with them for, for two or three years uh, prior to that. And, and sort of, you know, he, he colonized my imagination uh, is, I suppose, the, the, uh, the, the, the word I'd use, uh, the, the phrase I'd use, you know, that his, his work spoke to me. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, meeting him was a... a a mixture of, uh, you know, there was some disappointment, um, and then, you know, just watching him paint over a few days. You know, I I I didn't want to to study with him. I I never actually wanted to study with him. I, I did suggest at a certain point that I'd come and just be his model or whatever if he wanted, and just I just wanted to observe. Uh, what was going on around him. And I did find that interesting generally. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't get the chance because I ended up in, in, in the family way. You know, I ended up with kids and then my studies were over, basically. Yeah. So I want to pull up your uh, an image from Instagram since you're bringing up Odd Nerdrum. So I saw that when I saw this, I thought of Odd Nerdrum. Like you don't, you don't paint like Odd Nerdrum. If I were to look at your paintings as a whole, zoomed out, you know, I don't think Odd Nerdrum, but when I look at the details, I can see that influence. Is that a fair assessment? Oh yeah. I guess I was, uh, I was, I was very much, uh, you know, I, I, I studied his work very closely and, um, you know, did, you know, did my best to uh, assimilate something of his te- technique, but of course, like God's looking at Rembrandt and and yeah, um, right. He doesn't own you know, it. <laughs> like it's, I, I did. You know, he 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 doesn't own it, and I did find it. I found it very interesting when I was in New York and I saw his solo show in in two thousand and three, I think it was, and uh, and then you know went over to the Met to look at the the Rembrandts, you know, and went back and forth between the two. And it's like, okay, well, what, you know, he, you know, Odd is really trying to be Rembrandt, but what's the difference, you know? And and I thought that, you know, one of the big differences is that Odd is an anxious painter. He's really, uh, there's so much anxiety in his soul, in his spirit, and it and it comes out through in his paintings, you know, that there's an agitation uh, in in almost all his work, whereas uh, Rembrandt comes across as someone who is quite happy in his own skin, you know, mm. and and quite you know much more content and grounded, and uh, you know, you know, none of the sort of the confrontational, or very little of the sort of confrontational bullshit that goes with odds, and yeah. the whole, you know, uh, um, persona. Yeah, you know. To me, this one of the things that really separates you, though, is it's like Rembrandt, you've got the influence of the brushwork and application of Rembrandt or Ad Nerdrum, but with 
so much wider range and color. Your palette is much broader, at least it appears to be to me. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 I suppose I, I, I think of myself, you know, like if, if I was a pianist, I'd be list, you know, I want to play all the notes mm -hmm. and, um, uh, you know, experiment with, with a lot of the colors, you know, I don't like green, you know, you don't find much green in my pictures and I'm not, I'm not mad about the, you know, generally speaking about the mauves and the pinks and whatever. That's probably about the pinkest, one of the pinkest pictures I've ever done in terms of the, 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 the sort of the pastel shades in the background. Yeah. Uh, but, but that was, that, that was actually, you know, when I was doing that back in 2004, I was, I was very much in Odd Nerdrum's shadow, and I think I've moved out a little bit. Oh, this is a really old painting then. I wasn't yeah. aware of that. Oh, yeah, that's 2004. From, that's from 20 years ago. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's ages yeah. ago. Okay, I had no idea. Um, but it was like it, it, it was sort of, it was painted from life, and it was sort of interesting. Like I had this model in my studio, and um, he, he was, uh, you know, it, it was sort of funny because I was trying to get him to wear the snorkel, you know, the goggles or whatever. And his, his, he, it was too warm, and his, his, his face would just steam up. <laughs> and then I was spraying water on him to, to get the, the, you know, first of all, it was like baby oil, you know, to make him shiny, and then spraying water on him, and it was like, ah, you know, he was, he was between hot and cold, so he suffered for my art. Wow. But yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about your process. So let's look at this Elon Musk one you did here. And then down, yeah. down lower, this is your Instagram account, by the way, which is, can you, yeah. your Connor Walton 70 for those interested in looking it up. Um, but here is your process for this painting. Tell me a little bit about how you make a painting like this today. Well, uh, this this particular this is a second version of of my my painting of Elon Musk as as uh, I call it Salvador Tuesday and um, it it benefits from the fact that there's sort of a pre existing version so I, I I've, I've sort of eliminated a lot of the intermediary steps and just mm. lashed in with the paint so I've, I I just sort of put color straight down because I have. Uh, a, a template. The, the the first one I did more of a grisaille uh, to to start with and sort of pushed into color gradually. But if I if I can, I just put the color down. And often when I'm painting from life, I just put the color uh, down uh, as as directly uh, as I can. So um, it's it's very much just you know trying to cover the canvas, trying to be as spontaneous and direct in the moment as I can. Um, I try to work, uh, I suppose, in, intensely, but in short bursts. And I find the bursts are getting shorter as I grow older, you know, I, it's like I have to sort of work myself into the, the, the mode of concentration, and then I can get something done relatively fast, and then I'm knackered. Uh, but, you know, I used to put in much longer days um, painting, but I didn't get, I didn't actually get as much done in those longer days. You know, I was, I was much sort of slower and more, um, careful and I suppose more tedious. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, take risks. So what is a Where good painting session for you now? How long is that? Um, uh, typically, eight hours or something like that. Oh, that's not uh, short. Six hours, <laughs> like say, uh, well, it's 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 it it is getting short. I used to do ten hours, you know, mm. or, 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 or 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 it's more. It's mostly more towards six hours. And I had to. Like, it, it, it's partly something that evolved when I had kids because you know I was doing the the drop to school and picking up after school and making dinner and doing the shopping. So everything had to be concentrated into, you know, basically 9.30 until 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And, mm. and then I might get back later in the evening and, and just tidy up. But, the, you know, that, that was actually like having kids and, and the pressure around that really concentrated my, um, my effort, you know, where, where I, I just had to get more done in less time. 
and and focus more. And you know, I've I, I've used to listen to a lot of music when I painted, and and that has largely stopped. I just I I I, I can't deal with that sort of distraction, or 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 even if I have it on, I'm not really listening. You know, so so I just I work in silence, and I. Uh, I, I just try to stay very, very focused for as long as I can, and uh, usually until hunger overwhelms me. So no podcasts, no books on tape, just total silence. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow, I should try that. I I I feel like I have to have something to listen to, or I just get lost in my thoughts too much while I'm painting. Um. Sometimes I, I need to start, like sometimes I will stick music on to, to just get me going, you know, to, to, to break, break the silence or that, you know, it's a piece of music. So it's, it's going to take some time. And I, I, I have, I know I have that time, but I, I'm aware that I, at, at a certain point, I'm just not listening. Right. And, right. Uh, I, I, and, 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 and then, you know, I just don't press. Uh, you know, then it stops, and I just keep going, and I'm not, I'm not going to put on another CD or, 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 or you know, listen to the radio or whatever. I just keep going. Right, right. You just dated yourself, by the way, because nowadays we don't listen to CDs in the radio anymore. But <laughs> well, the problem is, I have about five thousand CDs, you know, and I'm yeah. never going to get them onto a hard drive. Uh, I know. And I and I used to listen like. I, I I used to listen to to music like ten hours a day, and and that was how I learned my music as well. You know, I I basically went through the repertoire. You know, I learned my classical music. You know, listening to Bruckner symphonies and operas as I painted. But uh, I I tend to look back on that time as you know maybe I was not working hard enough as a painter. You know, maybe I was just listening. You know, using using the painting as an excuse to 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 play music. Um, rather than the, the having things the right way around. So now it's much more focused. Yeah. And the other thing is, I think, you know, like music is very important to me uh, as, as, a, as an art form. And I've learned a huge amount through studying music and being attentive to music. Like, I think if you, if you want to learn about large-scale composition, you know, like complex composition, you have to, you know, Really, well, you don't have to, but looking at classical music is, uh, and learning classical music is a great way to imbibe it synesthetically, you know, because the, the, the symphonies and concertos by the, the, you know, the, the great composers are, are, are the, the biggest, most complex, large scale structures in art that the people have come up with, mm -hmm. you know, I think, you know, they're much, they're much more complex than anything painters, uh, generally speaking do. So if you can understand, like if you can actually, you know, grasp a Bruckner symphony from beginning to end, uh, you, you, you have, you have developed a part of your brain that can manage complex composition. Mm hmm. It's so interesting that doing this podcast because I meet all these incredibly successful artists who are so talented and feel so strongly about things like, like this, like things that are really not even necessarily related to art. I interviewed Martin Campos a few months back who like lives for music. He has to be playing music while he's painting. It feeds his creative juices and gets him motivated. That was... That was me at a certain point, yeah. but uh, um, at, at this point, I find silence works better yeah. for me. And and the you know, I, uh, music is hugely important to me. But I know the music; it's it's in my it's in my head. It's often you know playing away somewhere deep down in my subconscious uh, anyway. But I I, I I I in some ways I love music so much that that I want to give it my whole attention. So. Uh, if if I was painting and putting so much focus into my my painting, I know I I'm only listening to music with a, a fraction of my brain, and I don't want to treat it like music. You know, I don't want to treat it as background. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's a different a different attitude, I suppose. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, but it's just so fascinating though with this podcast how 
the, the personalities are well we all as you said we're all a little nuts but we're all a little nuts in a little different ways <laughs> it's great it's great meeting meeting everybody all these different artists all these different personalities so i want to go to your what what do you think is best to really take a tour of your work would you, would you prefer instagram or your website uh I, I I don't know. I suppose on, on my website, things are arranged by subject and by by um, uh, style uh, to to some extent. Where on on Instagram, it's more of a random walk. You know, I I tend to sort of mix what I'm doing today with what I did 20 years ago. Or so maybe Instagram's uh, the way to go then. Whatever. Maybe that's the way to go. So yeah. we get more of a broad look on what you do. So. One of the things that I love about your work is your your lighting choices. You do the most creative lighting in your work and also your paint application. So I wanna look at this orange one here. And then it, yeah. I don't know if you have a detail on this one. Yes, look at that yeah. paint application. It's so beautiful. So do you work in layers or are you working? It looks to me like, you're, yes, you're definitely working in layers. I can see it right through here. So tell me a little bit about your process. It, it's, I'm working. It, I could, it's it's very close to being a la prima. It is. Um, uh, mo most of the you know the bulk of the work is really done a la prima, and then there's a certain amount of of trying to tidy up the mess, but you know not go too far in tidying up. And and um, there's you know in. It, in some ways, I look at that at, at that, and I think, "Oh, it's such a mess," you know. But it's it's <laughs> that's how it, you're supposed to look at your own work. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe, but it's about uh, you know. I, I think some of the interest is just saving the mess, you know, mm -hmm. just being um, uh, like working um, impetuously. I, I suppose, and just trying to get the damn thing down, trying to put, you know, as you know, I often set out trying to make as few marks as possible. I often think like the first ten or fifteen marks really determine the painting and how good it's going really? to be. And if you end up having to correct stuff, you're you're on a you're on a loser, you know. So I I try to get you know make big bold decisions to start with, and then just you know refine up to a point you know but it's 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 like sort of it's it's building up um you know i use quite a rough ground to paint so that the the, the surface holds a lot of paint and i can work um uh you know i could i i can work let's say over a day putting layer upon layer uh onto the canvas and and they're they're grounded you know they'll stay in place so uh you know there's there's a lot of paint used in these pictures and and it's you know laid hmm. you know bit on top of bit um but as as roughly as i can get away with so what about um, your dark quickly as i can get away with how do you handle your darks when you're working on a rough canvas? Do you, do you does it not is is it okay for you to see the weave of the canvas through the dark values in the painting? Well, uh, well, I, I I'm putting a lot of black in there, you know. Like the the, the darks are are fully impasted. There's, oh, there's, they are. There's, you know, there's a good there's a good millimeter or two of paint all over. Oh, okay, um, and and you know applied with the palette knife often and, and smoothed with the palette knife or what i say smooth tamped down at least with the palette knife. so you're filling the so weaves there's, there's, in many cases i prime my own canvases and i prime them to uh a point where there's very little weave oh you do uh, so yeah so the, the weave generally isn't uh a, a problem i i like just enough weave that if I, let's say, if I scrape the canvas or scrape the paint, that uh, that a, a weave will show. But otherwise, the canvas is pretty smooth. 
Oh, I totally misunderstood. I thought you were saying you work on a rough canvas earlier. Okay. It is, it is, it is rough. The priming is rough. But so, it's, it's a thick, rough priming. The priming is rough. So, okay, let me make sure I understand this correctly. So, are, the, are you doing it with a brush and leaving brush marks in the priming? Is that what you're saying? No. No, I, I'm, uh, th there would be uh, typically six or seven layers of acrylic gesso. And then on top of that, I will put a, a medium. I think I you know, typically use something like uh, Winsor & Newton um, uh, modeling paste, but diluted. And it basically it has a tooth. Um, so the surface of the, of the canvas ends up uh, like a, a little bit like fine sandpaper. Um, really? Someone was showing me, yeah, someone was showing me a, a canvas primed with a new Michael Harding primer, which is, uh, you know, it's it's non-absorbent. It's a non-absorbent acrylic primer. And, and that is actually close to my, the, the finish on my canvases. But it, it has a, a, a tooth-like fine sandpaper. Like, a, I mean, sorry uh, to be so um, specific, but like what, like a 150 grit, like a 400 grit? I'm just, I'm trying to imagine this because it's so foreign to me, what you're saying. Uh, like a, a, something between a 400 and a 600 grit or something like that. So it's a very fine, but textured, gritty kind of a quality. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, I get, you, you can guess. You know, you can get oversized lumps in the medium and stuff like that. But for the most part, my, my aim is that it's fine, but that it, it produces a, a, a very um, integrated, cohesive surface. You know, like the, the, the problem with working in oil paint over an acrylic priming is that there's, there are different materials. They're totally different materials, and there's no chemical bond between them. Um, and if you work on a very smooth acrylic priming, um, the, the paint can um, just not bond to the surface, mm. essentially, because it's got nothing to grip. And and then the, the, the other problem is that uh, acrylic primer is always soft compared to oil paint. You know, oil paint goes pretty hard, ultimately. And, uh, and and the the acrylic priming underneath will always remain relatively soft and flexible. So you can end up with something that is a bit like um, in in miniature, a, a little bit like a, a a sponge cake with icing on top, you know, with 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 sugar icing on top, you know. Like if if the acrylic right. uh, priming is is the is the is the sponge cake. And the oil paint, if you put thin oil paint over that, it ends up like a sugar prime, uh, a sugar icing. And if you flex that, that uh, sponge cake, the, the, the icing will crack. Mm. Um, so that's, you know, that, that, that is always a problem with the, you know, oil over acrylic priming. But I try to produce a surface that, uh, the, the ultimate effect is a bit more like a, 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 a Christmas cake, you know, where it's, um, it's, it's a great it's analogy. It's a big fruit cake, you know, <laughs> and it's solid. And, and, and then you, and then yeah. you have to put, you know, this really thick uh, icing over it. And the whole thing is like, you, you could always hit it with an ax and, mm -hmm. and, uh, to, to, to get through it. You know, you always need to saw through the icing, <laughs> the, 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 the cake. So oh, this is that's, great. that's my aim. So, and and the, the, my ultimate surface is very robust. So you know, isn't the very tough surface. Isn't the canvas essentially like the sponge cake anyway, though? I mean, the canvas is always going to be flexible. So there's always going to be that layer that's potentially going to move and crack the, the frosting, as you put it. Well, like most... Most cracking will will come through from the priming, but it depends how you 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 manage it. You know, like I, get the, I think the, the the test for me is always like restretching a canvas, which is uh, this, this sort of a brutal operation, which often causes you know it can cause 
you know, cracking around the edges and stuff like that. And it's just like, well, what, what, you know, mixture of materials, you know, achieves the most robust effect. And, and the, the, that way of, of working for me, uh, you know, it, it achieves the most robust surface mm. and it sort of has the best of both worlds. It has the, you know, that, that surface will have the flexibility of the acrylic underneath it, but the toughness of the oil paint above, um, providing that it's, it you know they're just because of the way they interlock, you know, uh, that 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 that's that's my experience. And that's, that's great. It, information. It's experience over over twenty years and with lots of small disasters along the way. You know, like having small kids and you know I remember when I moved house, my my uh, two year old daughter took a biro and you know there were all these pictures leaning up against the wall and she took a a, a a uh, ballpoint pen to uh, my campuses, you know, and just scrolled across them. <laughs> and I was, and it was very interesting because, like, okay, you know, I, the, the what what paintings will withstand that sort of uh, trauma? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and and I had a lot of insecurity around my technique, and I often went out to you know buy. Uh, you know the 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 best uh, commercial, commercially prime canvas and all of that sort of thing. But those canvases didn't last as well as my my the, my hand primed ones did. You know, so it was like, okay, I think I know what I'm doing here. I think I found a good recipe. Yeah, well, I'm gonna give it a shot. So remind me what that middle layer was again. Uh, modeling paste is that what you said? Yeah, it's it's a it's a watered down uh, modeling paste. There, there's there's some sort of, um, you know, body material in mm. in the gesso. Like you could make you could make it up yourself with marble dust or, uh, you know, marble dust and the acrylic resin or something. So like that. So that's what's or, going or, on. Or, there's a dust. Yeah. There's some kind of a dust in there that gives it the grit. Yeah, whether it's ground glass or or something, it's just it's a translucent, okay, uh, slightly gritty material that helps to stabilize the uh, the acrylic and give it body, mm. and and it also like on an oil painting, like in over the acrylic, it it limits the absorption of the oil through the the uh, layers as well. Right, I'd love I'd love to get the, the actual product name and maybe we could post it on the show notes because i'm sure a lot of people are curious about this i mean this is the ground for a painting has always been a debate i feel like among artists um i mean i have so many acquaintances and friends that swear by rabbit skin glue and i i use acrylic gesso and then you're using acrylic gesso with modeling paste and it's like everyone's got an idea but um, I think, uh, I think a lot of my listeners might be really interested in trying yours. It sounds, it sounds like you've really thought it through. Yeah. Well, and I, I don't like, I really don't do the rabbit skin glue, glue or the half oil grounds or all of those. I found, I, I've always found those things very unreliable. Same. Um, and, and I, I think there's often a situation where effectively where the, the tradition is broken, you know, like we know, uh, you know, we know that there was a tradition and these were the traditional materials, whatever else. But, you know, I went, I went through the art college and I was told about these, the, these things, but I was never really taught properly. Uh, and, and, and my, my questions were never answered very clearly. Like, okay, like you can't, if you've got a really thick, heavy canvas, as opposed to, a light, you know, the, the finest linen, like you can't use the same formula of rabbit skin glue. So how do you vary this, you know? And, um, and I just found, well, at, at least with something like an acrylic resin, I know it's safe. I know it won't misfire. I know it won't crack. I know that the, 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 the problems with rabbit skin glue, that it's basically it's organic and it's hydroscopic and, uh, you know, there are various other issues that you have to, mind about it you know you can't make the mixture too strong and all of that at least i know that what i'm doing is safe yeah 
Yeah. Do you know what a lot of people in Utah are doing right now, my, myself included? Um, we're painting on ABS plastic. Have you heard of that? Nope. It's, uh, it's, it's, that's, it is what it sounds like. It's just a sheet of plastic. I buy it at eighth inch thick. And if I'm doing a painting that's under, that's 18 by 24 or under, I'll just sand the smooth side of it with 150 grit and paint right on it. And it is so absorbent. So if it's not great for all prima because huh? the first layer really sucks. It sucks up the paint in the first layer, but, um, but it's, I'm, I'm a believer. I think it's the, those paintings are going to be like the cockroaches of the painting world down the road. I mean, they're going to outlive everything. I mean, it's plastic. So, but I don't know, I could be wrong, but I've been painting on that for the past few years and it's been very successful so far. Well, I'm still, I'm, I'm trying to try new things. Like I, I tried polyester canvas recently, you know, just because I knew other artists were working on it and some were saying, well, it's, you know, it's more stable than linen or whatever, but I didn't like it. I have to say. I've know? tried I, it I, too. But no, no, I like my linen. Yeah. 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 Well, let's look at a couple more, not more. I'm hopefully more than a couple more of your paintings here. So tell me about this one. So, oh, love this. <laughs> love my this fat, reference. Shot. My fat lady. <laughs> Yeah, this is great. So, okay. So maybe humor is the wrong word, but there's just, it's not funny. There's nothing funny about your work. So humor is the wrong word. I used humor earlier. There's, even though there's well, clearly something dramatic happening, it's not intended to be funny. There's like a lightheartedness about it. And maybe that's just my, maybe that's just my, um, the way I look at it. I don't know. Tell me about this painting. Am I way off base? I mean, this is, it's like, is this like the apocalypse and I'm smiling and I should be crying? I mean, what's, what's happening right now? Well, yeah, it's the apocalypse. <laughs> and and <laughs> I'm a bit of a doomer, you know? So yeah. I, I, I've, I've, you know, like, like a lot of people on, on the, the sort of margins, the cultural margins of society, we, 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 we tend to, um, worry that there's a lot going wrong in the world and, uh, you know, where is it all leading? So, uh, this is the sort of the, 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 the logical extension of all of that doomerism, you know, which is, you know, to take, uh, um, a phrase, you know, it's not over till the fat lady sings and, and, you know, take it to its most, pessimistic uh um uh end you know well like okay well here's the fat lady singing and this is what and this is the end you know this is it's over you know it's really over so um i i'm i'm sort of indulging my um apocalyptic fantasy um in in this picture and uh i i suppose using Things the, the starting point for a lot of my paintings now can be a, a phrase, you know, uh, you know, like that, or or something that sort of has a common um, has common currency, you know, just some little phrase that that people, you know, attach significance to, and that has common currency and that circulates. So it's a bit like a meme, you know, or just something like that, you know, one of these little phrases. And I think, well, how could I sort of make a painting? out of that, you know, uh, that, that will, um, really, uh, resonate. Uh, so titles are very important to me at this point. Uh, you know, and, and I know some artists are totally different. Some artists hate titling their work and or come up with generic titles, you know, composition 14 or you know, nocturne or whatever it is, you know, just to, to escape having to put words uh, to the image. But for me, I try to create a very tight package with word and image so that the, that the title can never escape from the image, you know, that, that, uh, and, and, and that the, the, the title also really helps to make sense of the image so that when you, if you look at that, 
you know, if you look at the image and then you're told the title, it's like, aha, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a moment where, you know, I've taken something, you know, a commonplace phrase and just really twisted it as, as far as it can be twisted into a significant statement. Hmm. Um, uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, uh, and a lot of these things, they evolve over time. You know, I've had an idea. I had an idea of, you know, a painting of a really, really, really fat woman and what I could do with that. You know, wh- how could I make uh, an interesting picture out of that sort of subject? And, um, uh, you know, and, and I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm aware of, let's say, Lucian Freud and stuff like that, but I'm not really looking at him so much as, you know, the, the Willendorf Venus and, and the sort of the really, you know, primitive fertility goddess type um, uh, woman. And, and, this, and, and this figure, basically, it, it, is, it came out of my head. It's not based on, on um, working with a life model or anything like that. It's just like, okay, well, uh, how can I synthesize uh, a, a fantasy fat figure uh, and a scene um, that uh, will dramatize it and 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 make it um, fun? So I guess there is there, there is humor, but it's a very black humor. Right. Uh, well, I would and, agree with and, that. Yeah. It's like a. And, it's, and there is. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your point. Oh, no, I'd, I'd be interested to see what you think. Well, you know, we talked about Odd Nerdrum, so I'll bring that up again. So, obviously, he paints a lot of ap- apocalyptic work, you know. But the difference in my response to his and yours is dramatic because his genuinely makes me feel uncomfortable, right? Like, oh, I don't want to live in that environment, you know. Where yours almost has this, like, it, like well, as you put it, a dark humor, but like a political cartoon approach to it almost where it's uh while it's very very um masterfully painted there is that slight caricature quality to it that makes it fun to look at even though it's got a deeper more profound meaning yeah um well i i suppose maybe i i i think i think odd is a is a true believer in his own cult to some extent uh, and and that has the uh the, the 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 virtues that you know what he does has a sort of carries a sort of conviction to it that is that is awful you know it is horrible but he's he is demonic uh um and tortured as a person. I'm a little bit more balanced, I think, as a human being than he is. I'm not quite as crazy as he, he is. And I'm a little bit, um, I, I, I push, uh, I, I push my craziness out there in, into the picture, but I don't expect it to be taken, uh, entirely, uh, seriously. You know, right. uh, yeah. you can take it entirely. You can take it seriously. And it's like, OK, well, you you look at the world that we live in. And, and yes, we are potentially faced with absolute uh, calamity, you know, environmental catastrophe and overpopulation and, you know, all of the bad things that are happening. And I feel that, you know, deeply and personally. I, I It bothers me and I obsess about uh, these things. Um, but, uh, you know, within, within my work, it, it, it comes out, um, I suppose with a certain layer of self-consciousness there that I'm not, um, uh, I, 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 I know that, that where, you know, I, I know that people are tempted to look at my pictures, um, laugh you know uh, and and the the laughter can be a sort of a nervous laughter because it's like is this guy serious you know <laughs> and and i'm happy yeah. that there's a little bit of ambiguity 
there as, as to is this guy serious? You know, um, I may very well be serious, um, but I may very well be ridiculous as well. Uh, and um, I, I'm I, I have a, you know a little bit of niggling self doubt about my my uh, status as a prophet. So uh, I'm going to I, I, I'm 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 going to sort of you know give, give it all it's worth, but there's um, th- th- there's a possibility of uh, I suppose multiple interpretations or multiple readings that remain there that uh, that you don't I'm not going to uh, hit you over the head with a sledgehammer and and um, sort of awe you into submission. The way that uh, uh, Nerdrum might, you know, you yeah. can still you can still take it or leave it. You know, you can still find it maybe funny um, or absurd, um, but you know, and 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 there's this there's, there's this business. You know, I remember when I when I was with uh, Nerdrum and and basically was, we were having this discussion about the end of painting. You know, and and he was quite convinced that you know he was the last great painter. You know, <laughs> and there'd be no great. Wait, what year was after this? Him. What year was and this? And this was this was back in the early noughties, You know, two thousand three, two thousand four. But he he basically said, you know, uh, it's almost over, and painting. This he, he thought there's maybe about ten years left. You know, there there, there may be still. You know that there may be a little peak. You know, uh, basically with some of my disciples, like in ten years' time. Wow. But after that, it's going to be over. It's downhill. Mm-hmm. And and um, you know uh, and he out you know he he trumped my <laughs> pessimism um, with 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 that sort of thing. So the, 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 there is that sort of thing in 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 the background. It's like, well, you know, how bad are things today? But I I, I am sort of prepared to you know almost uh, push that notion of you know how how bad is it? It's all over. You know, is it all over? Uh, you know, can can I can I play the fat lady, and and my painting be you know you know represent the death knell of Western civilization, um, or uh, is is this is you know is Western civilization going to go on and we're just sort of caught in this you know uh, millennial apocalypticism? Mm. Well, I I feel like your description of your own work let me off the hook a little bit i hope it did because i (laughs) i don't want to be offensive in saying i find some humor in your work it's not but i i I think i I, for for me it's important that the that the work can be taken uh you know totally seriously Mm -hmm. or uh that 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 uh, a level of of self-conscious irony can be um at least positive, and 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 I will uh, and I will look at my own work, uh, you know, in in different moments, sort of thinking, you know, yes, civilization is ending, and 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 I'm a decadent basically, and 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 my work is a part of that expression, and I and I can uh, sort of say that with with a straight face and more or less um, uh, believe it. But, you know, there's this big question of well, what's going to be here in 200 years time? You know, is my work going to be in, in, in museums or are there going to be museums? You know, uh, we don't know. So, uh, you know, it could be like the decline of, you know, the Roman Empire and uh, I'm fiddling while Rome burns. Um, and, you know, there may really be a post-apocalyptic um, landscape uh, 200 years from now. But I don't know. I'm just seeing what's possible as an artist today, given the sort of the range of expression. Yeah. So <clears throat> another thing, another observation that I personally would make, and I, I mean, and I don't know if others agree, but there's also, while you do have this apocalyptic tone conceptually, I think there's a contrast because aesthetically your work is very beautiful. 
right? And a lot of artists in the past who've done these dark conceptual paintings, while the paintings might be well composed, they're usually dreary colors and grays and just dull and dark, you know, where yours are light and vibrant and colorful. And yet you're describing something that's dark and gray and dreary often with these light, bright, chromatic colors. Well, I don't regard my work as beautiful at all. Uh, I think it's, 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 um, tacky and, <laughs> and weird. And no weird. way. It's uh, awesome. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, 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 I think my work is, is quite, quite ugly. You um, can't be serious. Uh, uh, Come on now. <laughs> oh, I, I, no, no. And, 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 and to be honest, I, you know, in terms of my own attitude, I, I have, I have a skewed beauty. I know what beauty is. If I wanted to paint beautiful pictures, I wouldn't paint, um, you know, uh, Donald Trump and, 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 um, you know, hucksters and astronauts and all, you know, all, all of this thing. You know, I, I, and, and I, I, I have, I, I, you know, I, I paint mountains and trees and flowers and, and, yeah. and pretty things, you know, and, and nature. And I don't do that. I paint, I, I, I paint stuff, which is, I think, troubling and uh and with a, a, a you know a lurid troubled palette which which you know i i pushed a certain color range you know particularly into my oranges and stuff like that which is more or less self-consciously hellish you know and it's it's pushed to a degree maybe that that it it's you know i i, I still try to find um a, a a beauty in what I'm doing, but I'm aware of it as a perverse beauty, you know, like, a, you know, where, where Francis Bacon has talked about his approach to color, you know, and where, where he talked about, you know, finding beauty in, in the color of the inside of your mouth and, and things like that, you know, where people don't you know, generally look to find beauty, you know, the, 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 that, that is, to some extent what I'm doing. But but my my own attitude is I do not paint beauty. I do not try to paint beauty. I try to paint meaning. What I want is meaningful uh pictures. Pictures that communicate. Uh the the beauty, if it happens, it, it will happen to some extent despite my subject. See, okay, so Maybe it's just semantics, but what, what you've just, what you described earlier was, um, cliche, beautiful subjects. No. So it's one thing to, to, to choose subjects that are already beautiful in order to be more likely to achieve success in making a beautiful painting. It's another thing to take difficult subjects like you're doing serious subjects and apply a sense of beauty in design and composition and color. So what I'm stating, and I, I just don't believe you're not doing this, is that you're using your skills of design and composition and, and your, your, your sense of uh, color in order to create beautiful paintings with not such beautiful subjects. Like it, because I mean, when you're designing these things, you must be thinking about balance and repetition and unity and all of these things and trying to create something that's pleasing to look at while still being meaningful. Am I, am I way off base? Uh, I, 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 I think there are, di there, there are different ways of parsing that. Um, I, I I am aware. I get, let's say in the picture that you've pulled up there, where I think I, that orange is an aggressive, dissonant color for yeah. me, and I've chosen it for a reason, uh, and it works. The the whole picture works for a reason, um, but I would not call that a, a, a beautiful picture. I'm not even sure I would want it on my wall. You know. Um, you know, and I, I find obviously, I, I to some extent, I hate my own work. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm the sort mm. of artist who I, I don't want my own pictures on my walls. They annoy me. You know, and and 
I, I, I'd want to get them out there and, and, you know, make money from them so that I can do the next one. But I'm never totally satisfied with what I'm doing. But to, to me, the important thing is to, to make meaning and to embody a high level of craftsmanship. Now, to me, craftsmanship and beauty are not the same thing. When I want beauty, I go to the beach and I look at the sea and I look at the waves and I look at the sun going down and these fill me with, with peace and contentment. Uh, I do not expect anyone to find peace and contentment in my work. I do hope they will find craftsmanship, that the things are well made. Uh, but again, you know, you don't, I, for, for me anyway, I don't go to the 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 beach and look at the sunset and think, wow, that's an amazing composition. You know, to think of it as a, you know, to think of it as a composition, to put a frame around it and it becomes art. And uh, when, when I'm seeking beauty, I try to get away from art. I try to get into nature and, and mm. something that can, um, you know, that I can escape from my own pain, you know, and that I can be, uh, you know, and, and, and the thing about art as well, it, you know, I, I think I, where Kant talked about beauty and the notion of, of dis, disinterested judgment, which was, was very important. And he basically, he didn't think that art, generally speaking, was beautiful. He thought that nature was, was uh, beautiful. But his argument was that painters are always trying to sell you something, basically. And in the whole cultural sphere, there's always, you know, basically sugar and salt put on the product to make it palatable, you know, and and you're always being sold a product. And the and the um, the the artist is always got the mentality of, you know, how can I appeal to the, you know, base or acquisitive interests of the buyer to make him buy my piece? And uh, and I do that, of course. I want to appeal to the um, the, uh, the 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 covetous, you know, uh, primitive desires of my audience that they'll buy the work and and, and give me money. Um, but when I go out to you know to the forest or to to you know, look at the sea or watch the sun go down. No one's trying to sell me anything there. It just is. It exists, and it's not struggling to be something. It just is. And that's where I find peace. So that that is my idea of beauty. Uh, I think what what I produce, and to some extent, what all artists produce, is um, uh, it's. It, it's always going to be a flawed or, um, uh, you know, tainted by um, our our issues, our problems, and they're all over my work. You know. Hmm. Okay. So perhaps beauty is too broad of a term. I like how you made the distinction between beauty and craftsmanship. But that said, do you collect art yourself? Do you have any other artists' work in your home? I've got a few, uh, and and they're just swaps, basically, because okay. um, I, I I just you know once, once you have kids, you, you yeah, know, everything it's expensive. Goes, it's expensive uh, into in, into into the that, and I haven't been able to have uh, an art collection except where you know a few artists have given me presents or swapped. Uh, work with me. I do have a couple of paintings that I've I, I inherited from my my father basically, and they're very nice and they're you know very beautiful, but very very traditional. Um, and I like having them. Um, you know, it's it's the sort of the, the sort of pictures that I might have in my bedroom or my study. Uh, you know, spaces where I don't want to face my own demons. So, okay, so you've already answered my next question, and that was going to be, do you find beauty in other artists' work? And, and I, should, I should be more specific. Do you find beauty in other artists' works whom you, pers who, whom you respect, 
who aren't painting cliche flowers and sunsets. And I mean, I don't, may, <laughs> I shouldn't even say this cliche. I love paintings of flowers and sunsets, but I, I think you understand my point. Uh, I, I suppose my, my, my orientation in, 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 in culture is that I'm interested, I'm much more interested in the idea of meaning or significance mm -hmm. than, than in the idea of beauty. So, so there are, there are artists that I know that, that produce beautiful work and, and in a sort of an art for art's sake, you know, that they have an innocence about them. Uh, but it's, is, you know, and I can, I can enjoy that work. Uh, but it, it doesn't seize me by the balls, mm -hmm. you know, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't grab me by the, by the, the scruff of the neck and, and, uh, uh and, um, you know, compel me to, to, uh, pay attention, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm much, I'm much more interested. I think there's, there's a, a saying from Fontenelle, which I'm very fond of. He was, he was a, a sort of a late 17th, early 18th century philosopher. And he said, you know, basically madmen we are, but, but not of the type that are locked up in the madhouse. Uh, because if you're in the madhouse, it doesn't really matter what madness afflicts the person in the next cell. But it matters to us, you know, because it's really important to us that we understand the madness of our neighbors and, and of our society. And I, and art to me is really interesting where it reveals things about the human psyche that would otherwise remain hidden. So, so that is the work that, uh, really draws me and you know like the, the the artists like you know i love goya you know for example you know and goya is you know what what he what he revealed where he went fascinates me um and an artist who will do that who have a, a a a demonic element and you know a lot of the renaissance artists you know i think i think there there are artists like you know let's say botticelli or 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 uh whatever who 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 painted you know pretty much a very sort of stylized version of beauty and uh they're they're not the renaissance artists that particularly appeal to me either you know i'm much more interested in in the ones that um had problems mm. you know um and you know and 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 you know leonardo and michelangelo uh where oh we're there you know they're the classic tortured artists you know um um so i i'm i'm much more interested in in art as a revelation of soul and a revelation of psyche and uh, a revelation of what was hidden or would be hidden otherwise in our in our culture than in uh work that um is is you know let's say light and innocent and 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 focused on the 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 purely visual end of experience but what about this i mean does does beauty and meaning have to be mutually exclusive i mean can't they exist in the same painting um Yes, they. I, 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 I suppose they can. Um, but you know, maybe my my attitude. You know, it's, it's maybe a sort of a quasi-religious attitude that we're, you know, we're 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 post-diluvian. You know, we're fallen creatures, and um, uh, where I think a lot of you know, there's a there there different approaches to what you might call the religiosity of art. You know, a lot, a lot of people have turned to art as a substitute religion, you know, for, for, for better or worse. And our museums have become like temples 
And people often go to the museums, they stand in front of a work of art, expecting something like an epiphany, you know, more or less literally, you know, like it's like a religious experience. And, uh, and there are artists who can provide, um, what would you say, that, that, that can cater to that innocently. Um, or, or there are artists that can, uh, give you more, I think. Um, so I think, I, I, I think generally speaking, I think culture is the realm of meaning and nature is the realm of beauty. And, uh, our artists, try to combine, you know, culture and nature in their, in their work and draw on the beauty of nature. But the end result is still culture. You know, ultimately it's, it is, you know, we, we, you know, we don't produce, um, uh, beauty the way, you know, uh, uh, an apple tree produces apples you know, which is just effortless and spontaneous and nature doing its thing. It's hard work for us. And and where we produce the illusion of of effortlessness, um, it's 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 fake, you know, it's a lie. Um now the lie can be very interesting, but I but I'm 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 interested in uh that the the sort of the Jacob wrestling with the angel end of uh the business rather than um, trying to make it look easy, trying to make it look effortless and beautiful and simple and harmonious and peaceful. Hmm. So what about this thought? Um, so if I were a songwriter and uh, I wrote a song that was packed with meaning, but the music, the melody, the notes were just ugly. No one listened to it, right? It was, it was not pleasing to hear. Um, it, it wouldn't be very effective. So the meaning would be lost on the listener. At least that's how I would, uh, what I would expect. It would be lost on me. If it wasn't a pleasant song to listen to, I'd no longer hear the meaning because I wouldn't be willing to listen to the tune. Um, is, can that, is it possible that art can be the same way? You put a painting in a museum that's meaningful, but it lacks some sense of draw and attractiveness to the viewer that the viewer will walk past and miss the opportunity to learn the meaning? Well, uh, present, um, you know, lots of, lots of powerful music is, 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 you wouldn't necessarily call pleasant. You know, if you're interested in rock and roll, if you're interested in the blues, if you're interested, you know, like the, the, you will you will hear pain and suffering on the surface, you know, right there in your face, and and that doesn't make it that that doesn't repel people, generally speaking, because it's authentic. They 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 they've experienced that pain too, and they know it's real. So I don't think we should be afraid to to you know I don't think we should pull our punches. And, and think that you can't be dissonant or, or, um, edgy or, uh, uh you know, I, can, I, 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 I think it's what, what really matters beyond talent is authenticity. And, um, I think, you know, beauty is best left to look after itself. Um, if people find my pictures beautiful, I'm thrilled. I'm delighted. Uh, but I didn't set out to make them beautiful. I set out to uh, express something. And if I succeed well, maybe... People will say, oh, that's beautiful. But maybe, uh, you know, I would just use a different word to uh, to describe it. 
but I don't, I don't think, you know, I, the problem with beauty and art is that when an artist pursues beauty, the result is almost inevitably mannerism. And, and that has been the, the case over and over again, you know, and if, if you, like you, if you read Fasari and the lives of the artists and whatever else, and this whole business, they were so, you know, the Renaissance artists and the late Renaissance artists were so hung up on beauty and what was beautiful and having to be beautiful. And today, when we look at that work, and they thought they had the formula for beauty, and, and most of those pictures look really weird today mm-hmm. because, you know, it's, it, it, it looks stylized, it looks mannered, it looks um, full, and, and a lot of it was, you know, because if you, 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 you know, particularly in, in the, you know, the, in the Renaissance, the 14th century, the 15th century, that period, you know, you, 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 if you read about the lives of the artists and what clothes they wear, you know, and 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 the the hard lives that they had and the hard things that they did to people around them, and and they were working for clothes, you know, like the, the the aristocracy of the time. They were thugs. They were absolute gangsters. Uh, and and the you know the church were pretty much in the same um, business, and it it has, it has always struck me that there's, there's something quite um, airy fairy about the artwork of that time that isn't 100% authentic, and uh, I think that's a mistake. And that airy fairiness just went became compounded over a hundred years. Uh, in, into, um, you know, more and more extreme forms of mannerism until artists got back to nature, essentially, and you get people like Caravaggio coming in, basically being really, as it was seen at the time, ugly, you know, dirty feet, um, toothless models, um, old hags, dirty people, rags, um, you know, none of the concern for refinement and elegance and sophistication that, you know, you get with Bronzino or someone like that. Mm. Um, but it was, but it, it had power. It had impact. And that is much more important than being beautiful. Mm. So if you were to give advice to a young artist, would you say that it's, it's important to just be authentic? And if you're, if what you create authentically, people find beautiful, great. If they don't, fine. But it's authenticity that should be at the root of your desires as an artist. Yeah, I, 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 I do think that. I think, you know, I think it's really important to have beliefs that you can express through your work. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, that is, you know, that is one of the big problems because the, the people necessar- don't necessarily have strong beliefs that they can embody in their work. Uh, and, and, and that, that is what I think makes a lot of artists techniquey, you know, that they get obsessed with technical correctness and procedure because they don't really have anything to say, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's it's all about the 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 how instead of the what. And I've always been of the view that if you know what you want to do, the how just become self-evident, you know? It's like, if you know where you want to go, you will find the route to get there. Uh, but it, it's if you don't know where you want to go, that you you are potentially, um, you know, just reading the rules of the road um, and thinking that the rules of the road is the Bible, but you're not actually getting to somewhere interesting. 
So, um, I really, I, yeah, I, I really think that it's, it's important, and I, and and it's you know it's somewhere where I I would differ. You know, a lot of people say, oh well, you know, there's this thing of you know finishing a painting. How do you know when a picture's finished? And some artists, you know, even Lucian Freud saying, you know, well, that's the most difficult thing. The most difficult thing in the world is to know when a painting is finished. And I don't think that's true. No. Uh, I think if you know if you know what you want to achieve, you know when you've got there. And and it, there may be about a bit of doubt, but it's it's down to you know it's a bit like if you know you you. You 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 know where you want to get to, and you get within you know you you drive a hundred kilometers, you get within a kilometer, you get you know then you 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 refine, you get within you know a hundred meters or, or 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 fifty meters and ten meters, and the, there can be that little bit of doubt about the last bit. Well, you know, are you are you really bang on exactly where you want to be? But the real business is is in the hundred kilometers. You know, it's not yeah. in the last 10 meters. You know what? It's interesting you say so, that about finishing a painting, because I think that the reason you don't have trouble knowing when it's done is because you are so concept and idea driven. Because when the idea has been stated, you can just stop. But someone who is simply craftsmanship driven or simply beauty driven, it can never be well enough crafted. Like there's no end to how well crafted something can be or how perfect its craftsmanship can be. And there's no, no definitive end to how beautiful something can be. So it's like this finish line that just keeps moving as you get closer to it. Would you agree with that? Well, I think it, uh, my, my process is to some extent open-ended, you know, and often I, I, uh, I think, Okay, right. That picture is finished. Um, I'm done, and I'll go back in the next day, and I'll think, oh no, or a week later, you know, or something niggles, you know, something something niggles, and I think, no, I didn't get that right, and I have to go back. But it, it's still based on a, a, a name, you know, and it can take a long time. I've had pictures on the go for ten years. Really, that's a long time. Uh, yeah, and and I've I, I've had you know problem pictures and unresolved things and and I know they're not finished and I know I don't know how to finish them uh and I leave I leave them until I do but in uh in 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 principle I I have an idea of uh, of what the aim is if I if I'm having trouble w with with that process it's because I don't know where the aim is you know so right. I don't know exactly what I'm trying to do. And I do try to leave my process open that that's a possibility, you know, uh, that I, I'm i um, finding my way towards something and experimenting and trying things and failing. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you, there, at some point, you should be able to stand back uh, and say, yeah, I've I've achieved, you know, what I said out to, and it can and it can also work both ways. You know, sometimes like with with my paintings where I'm working from life, and I I'm really dissatisfied with my work at the end of the day. You know, I think God, that's a fucking mess, and it didn't work, and there's so much I want to correct in this picture. And then I come in a day later, and I think. Actually, no, I'm going to leave it like that. It's fine. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Let's look at some more of your work now that we've talked a little about it. But first, before we go on, I want to know about this. It says the man who stole the moon or sold, sold the moon. The man who sold the moon. Yeah. Tell me about this concept. Well, uh, uh, if, is uh, I, I suppose one of the starting points is these little figurines that I've picked up uh, uh, along the way. Having kids, you end up with a lot of toys around the place, and and the, you know I, I found these astronaut figures, um, which my kids liked, and um, I, I ended up making 
you know, using them in still lives, you know, and 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 the, the central uh, figure there is um, a little model of Alan Bean, who was a NASA astronaut uh, who who you know, you know, walked on the moon and uh, whatever else. He's dead now. Um, but there's this model of this mm -hmm. sort of you know grinning all-American hero in his spacesuit that I sort of loved. And I used him in a lot of paintings and a lot of still lives. You know, I'd put him with, you know, uh, uh, you know, some fruit and a toy dinosaur and 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 various things. Uh, but I I ended up moving towards using those figures less in like, you know, proper still life setups and more like Film stills, you know, like more like the, you know, the the the, the mise en scène of the figures was liberated. So in this case, I I used two of these astronaut figures, and and some other figures that I got the 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 sort of huckster cowboy um, character is actually an adapted Winston Churchill figurine mm. that I bought. That I put a that I put a cowboy hat on, <laughs> and then there's sort of you know sort of the, the, there was, these were like, I don't know whether you know Doctor Who. It's a British mm -hmm. um, science fiction TV series, but there, there are various characters uh, that you can buy figurines from uh, uh, from that series. And they had a Winston Churchill, you know, and all the time travel, whatever. So they had Winston Churchill. They had a scientist. They had a sort of a a military guy, and I put those in the picture too, and it sort of ended up sort of constructing a narrative. The narrative is basically sort of people cheering for, you know, the sort of notion of technological progress and triumph and whatever, and they don't quite understand what what's going on, and that's sort of the notion of the man who sold the moon. It's the title of of a book by Robert Heinlein, uh, a you know well known science fiction author. Uh, but I sort of I I took it, I suppose, as um, a, a metaphor for bad politics, you mm. know, for overpromising politics and the sort of nexus of, you know, military industrial complex, space program, uh, and you know, you know, rampant nationalism. Uh, as something that we're we're still sort of, you know, certainly in in the U.S. you're still uh, living with, you know, the space program, which is really about, you know, it's not about science. It's about money and jobs and and lots of other, uh, you know, lots of other agendas. The, the man who sold the moon is also sort of, you know, the Donald Trump style populist politician, right. Um, and 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 the painting is to some extent about the you know the corruption the corruption of politics through spectacle. Right, right. Okay, so let's see, let's see something completely. Oh, yeah. So you've got a fair number of political ones here. Um, you def this one I have to show because you just mentioned Donald Trump, and I find this one. See, come on, you even laughed. See, you even laughed. So I'm off the hook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You got. You got to admit that's fun. Well, I did. I did have fun with 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 this one. I had particular fun because mm -hmm. uh, this I, I this was curated into a show in in um, California by Michael Pierce, and it was called The Illusionist. And they they had um, you know Boris Vallejo and Zykon and the Barbarian uh, illustrators as part of the the show. And and I thought it'd be fun to do a sort of a Trump con on the barbarian version. But the like the show opened um basically the day before April first. And I proposed with Michael that we sort of uh put the painting out on April first. And I would say, you know, thrilled and honored to paint President Trump's official portrait, you know, flying to Washington for the unveiling and and see what happened. And uh, I, it was very funny, you know, because I people were so, um, you know, with with Trump, there was just, you know, people could not, they didn't know what to expect next, you know, and it was like people were in a constant state of shock. So when I put this picture up as D Donald Trump's official portrait, 
a lot of people thought, oh, my God, look what Donald Trump's done now. And my God, you know, Connor Walton, he made the deal with the devil. Wait, and, wait, and people, it was, yeah, people it believed funny. it. Yeah, some people believed it. <laughs> um, and some people, and then, and, and, and it was, it, it was sort of what I was trying to do. My notion was to try to paint a picture, which was sort of, I, I, I thought of the dancing along the cultural fault line, you know, as doing something that would, would, would appear differently depending on how you looked at it on the cultural spectrum, you know, so, or the political spectrum, so that like a Trump supporter could look at this picture and say, hey, this is big macho Donald Trump and he's got the American flag and everyone's saluting him and isn't it great? And, and uh, someone on the left could say, you know, Hey, look at this sexist uh, barbarian, um, you know, who's destroying our country. Isn't it awful? And they could both sort of look at the picture and take opposite messages from it. And I could sort of uh, then, uh, you know, have, and, and, and then they would see how the other people saw it and have to reconsider their own estimation of the picture, their own estimation of their own judgment. So that that was part of the 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 game uh in that. But it was also, I suppose, I think the United States is threatened by uh political fascism of different varieties. I think there's potential for fascism from the left and fascism from the right in, in current United States politics. But I was interested to basically think what would American fascist art look like and propose an answer? And I thought it would be immersed in, you know, the, 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 the you know, macho superhero um, fantasy schlock, um, you know, popular culture, you know, you know, filtered through Hollywood, filtered through, um the 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 d c comics and 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 fantasy art and and all those you know the cheap fantasy novels and all of that so I tried to draw on all of those resources and some of which i like you know i love um the the um frank Frazetta and boris Vallejo and 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 those sort of fantasy artists i think their work is amazing, but I wanted to sort of see what uh you know where it could be taken. Um, in terms of its meaning. So it's again, I could not trying to be beautiful here, uh, but it, it was, it was to do something that would carry, uh, a message and an ambiguous message that could be read in, in, in different ways and was, you know, attuned to different interpretations. So like Trump is carrying this, you know, the American flag, obviously, which is like, you know, it has a, it, it, that has a statement, but the flag is tattered. And the, the the flagpole has obviously been, you know, ripped out of the ground or out of whatever it was attached to. So there's this sense of, you know, uh, conflict, uh, you know, that's, that permeates, you know, you've got the culture wars ongoing. And, and then, you know, I thought about, you know, I had to complete the picture and this, that the, you know, if, if you didn't have the fascist loop in the bottom left, I think it it might be taken as a more innocent picture or a more boosterish uh, painting for Trump. You know, it could be used as Trump propaganda. But if the Trump people want to use that for for propaganda, they have to uh, own those fascist salutes at the bottom left, and I think that makes it problematic hmm. uh, for for them. But if, but if they do. If they do own it, if they do use it for propaganda, well, then they're uncovering something. Hmm. You know, then they're making a statement uh, that isn't so ambiguous. Wow. Yeah, that's a heavy painting. They might also have to get rid of the dead bodies he's standing on. <laughs> that's no small thing. <laughs> oh, well, that's, <laughs> There's you that know, little dead, thing there. Dead bodies are nothing. Like, you know, American <laughs> politics is full of dead bodies. Oh, and, my gosh. You know, 
like this, 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 there's all of this, you know, if you think of it, if, if those, those dead bodies are Nancy Pelosi and, 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 and all the rest, you know, like there's, there's plenty of people who'd be quite happy with, with, uh, you know, Trump standing <laughs> on those dead bodies. So, okay. Do you wait, do you have a finished one of this, this Putin one? Uh, is this yeah, in here? Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Okay. There. Yeah. Tell me about this yeah. one. I mean, I obviously I can read into yeah, it, but well, I want to hear your, your thoughts on it. Uh, well, it's, it, it's called, uh, it's called Tsar Bomba, which is the, the, the name of the biggest Russian atomic weapon that, that was ever built. I think the big, biggest ever, you know, the biggest ever atomic bomb was built, was, was called Tsar Bomba, or literally Tsar Bomb, you know, in, in Russian. And, uh, I, I sort of think of Putin as, as a bit like that, metaphorically speaking, but he's obviously been, you know, rattling the nuclear saber and stuff like that so i thought well what uh, can i paint the, the 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 worst the worst nightmare um uh of uh you know what we might be threatened with by putin and uh yeah I, but it's it's sort of you know i'm i'm obviously i painted him naked on on the bomb um, you know, obviously, you're, you're, if you're riding an atomic bomb, you don't necessarily need clothes. <laughs> but it's it's playing with the idea of, yeah. of um, you know, the naked emperor and, uh, you know, mixing, you know, macho uh, statement with a certain amount of male vulnerability, you know? Yeah. So yeah, and uh, but yeah, it's 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 a political statement. I'm I'm you know as as a European, what's going on in 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 Ukraine at the moment is very um, concerning, I suppose, and I think that there's a lot at stake for Europe in terms of um, you know resisting Russian fascism, mm -hmm. essentially. So that this is my little. Uh, my little war effort. Uh, some people were pissed with me for, as they saw it, glorifying uh, Putin. Um, to me, but... it looks like you're making fun of him. And that's why I, I want to yeah. laugh. I laughed again when I saw it. I see, again, I see humor in it. I mean, it's not, it's, it's snarky humor, in my opinion, if it's there at all. I want people to comment on this video to see if they see the humor in it or not. I'm curious how other people perceive it but it seems like it's a snarky jab to me well it's it's the the, the danger is is real like obviously the, the the painting sort of quotes dr strangelove and that yeah i've seen in the movie where uh um this is what sam pickens sort of you know uh you know rides the bomb to oblivion um and uh, you know, we, we, we have to consider where this war is going and possibly it will end up in some sort of nuclear war. Although I think that's, a, that's probably a small, you know, minor uh, risk, but, uh, we are, you know, we're still tormented by nightmares of, you know, what, what could go wrong in our world. You know, we haven't vanquished the, the, the nuclear issue, um, you know, we have to still worry about these things. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm painting a picture that, that sort of conjures up my worries and, and sort of exercises my demons. Um, uh, but there's, you know, there's, there's a, a little sort of, I suppose, play in mythology, you know, like the notion of the fallen angel, you know, of Lucifer, um, you know, the, the, the bringer of light, that 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 the, the the mythos of this picture is uh, Putin as Lucifer, you know, the light bringer. But the light yeah. that he's bringing is 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 um, you know the light of of um, uh, you know nuclear explosion. It's like the whole business of of nuclear war, you know, it's, it's it is mad. You know, it's the whole notion of mad and mutual assured destruction. It's, it's that we got ourselves into the position where, um, you know, nuclear deterrence makes any sense at all. Or does it make sense? Or, 
how, you know, how do we deal with it? It, it? it is a sort of a madness. And that that movie, you know, Doctor Strangelove epitomized it at the time. With we still got to deal with the the equivalence, you know. And it is it's sort of funny when when you know Donald Trump says, you know, my my red button's bigger than yours, and all of this sort of thing. You know, he actually said that. It's it's crazy, but um. But it's it's also real. This is this is where we're at. Well, let's go a little more lighthearted for, before we close. I want to I want to look at some of your still lives because I love your still lives, and that way we can all sleep tonight because we'll try and remember the still lives. <laughs> but I'm going to go to your website for that. Let's see. We'll do still life one. Start there. What, see, uh, you use these, and this is something I relate to because I love doing multiple colored light sources on my portraits and stuff. So I think that's one yeah. of the things that appeals to me about your work is the beautiful colors that you bring in with your different lighting. Um, but I just want to click through these a little bit. And if you have, oh, I love this one. Love this one. Do you have anything you want to say about this? Yeah. It's Okay, well, it's called Still Life with Judgment, and it's uh, basically it's an allegory using the theme of the last judgment weighing of souls as uh, a, a sort of a template or a, or a, um, a, a scaffold to to uh, erect a still life subject. So I use like literally the weighing scales, the 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 face on the scales, and then a bunch of books uh, beneath the scales and um to to make it a bit about um you know i'm 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 quite into philosophy you know i'm into i i i i read philosophy and i'm into abstract thought and those sort of things and this picture is sort of an image of you know the thinker the philosopher with you know the, the face on the front but there's this sort of calculating machinery behind the face and then there are all these books stacked up underneath it and uh to some extent, that's me, you know, I'm, I'm sort of the rational calculating character and I read all these books and I, you know, make all these, you know, you know, critical assessments and, and judgment, you know, that, that is what judgment means in a way, you know, that we, 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 we store up knowledge and experience and we try to, you know, use it to make good sound judgments about our, our, our world. So that, that's sort of the double meaning. Mm -hmm. of the of the painting but it's sort of it, it the contrast in the picture is between a sort of a a pure intellectualism represented by the the uh, the the mask and the upturned face and then the sensuality of the fruit which you know is very much about appealing to the senses and you know you know the the, the richest most vibrant colors that i could uh make it so it's trying to balance you know sensuality and intellect oh my gosh okay i know you don't want your paintings to be beautiful but sorry you screwed up on this one <laughs> it is gorgeous it is gorgeous okay all everyone else i want uh, there's another thing i want people to comment on does connor walton paint beautiful paintings because <laughs> no. I, I, I don't think you can help it i don't think you can help it it is absolutely gorgeous. And so I'm assuming, oh, a private collection. I was going to ask if it was sold, but it is, obviously. Okay, another beautiful painting. How, what? Tell me about this one. Uh, it's called Microcosmos, and it, it's basically one of these pictures where I try to shove everything into it. You know, it's just basically a still life with, with everything in it, at least conceptually. So you've got the earth, and you've got the 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 the, the background is the uh, the stars the sort of the 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 classical image of the stars with constellations, mm -hmm. um, you know the constellation figure, and um, and then you know you've got uh, a an infant uh, life mask or death mask, and you've got the skull as sort of birth and death, you know, old age and 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 youth, and you've got book and wine you've got fruit you've got the the trumpet which is sort of um uh, i suppose 
invoking the last Trump, you know, the last Trump weighing of souls. So I tried to get, you know, everything in. It's still, you know, it's it's more or less a traditional Thanatos to life. I used, you know, a, a Persian carpet, a bit like the way that a Dutch painter would, you know, sort of a big sort of rug on a table. Um, and uh, uh, just just try to stick everything in the picture so that it it is, complete as a statement of, you know, everything that we deal with in, in the world, at least in sort of miniature forms. That's the idea of the microcosm, the miniature world. No, I like that. So your other folder for still life, are these more recent? Uh, yeah, some of those, uh, yeah, the, the, well, the, the ones that you were looking at previously, the ones that you were looking at previously were like uh, 90s. Okay, um, okay. Pictures are early, early noughties. 2012, uh, yeah, I I went, I sort of chose, uh, I, I went towards using more like natural light, mm -hmm. uh, you know, single light source, natural light, and just using the, the, the colors of the objects and using more ostensibly modern objects, you know, plastic bags and things like that, that, that would um, uh, give, uh, you know, maybe a more contemporary feel or, or, or a more, uh, you just relate a little bit more to contemporary experience and not be quite so old masterish. Although this is still basically an exercise in chiaroscuro, you know, it's still basically, um, you know, that the play of fear and obscure in the plastic and in the um, the veiled figure, yeah, uh, the, the veiled plastic act. I love that concept, that con that contrast between this, the veil of her face and how the plastic bag acts like a veil to the fruit. It's an, it's it's, an, it's a nice little um, you know it's a neat little package in terms of yeah. getting a concept to work with the the objects and you know my, my approach to composition it can be very complicated and uh you know and using mathematics or whatever but i often just like to just use the you know use the center line use the 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 you know straightforward pyramidal composition you know go for the the center punch and um you know, be really, really straightforward in how I set the work up and just be strong, you know, just, just do it with, with strength and power. Okay. So now this one, you're, well, let me see. No, it's, it's still just one light source, but it's a direct light source from below. That's unusual. Uh, there actually are, there are two light sources of the source from above. So you have a softer one from above and a really bright direct one from below looks like yeah 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 that's um, that's great is there any did you want to comment on this one uh no no this is i get, i remember i remember painting that and and, and the, the 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 problem that i had painting it was that i was the dim light uh, is actually the light that i was painting it in you know and i had this sort of brilliant spotlight that that i had to fight to oh. see what I was doing, you know. So it's it's. I remember it being really difficult painting under those like conditions uh, to get that sense of you know almost like nightlit um, uh, luminosity. Uh, but it's you know the, the, with with pictures like that, what often happens is I try to set up a really complicated picture, you know, with all sorts of allegorical meanings, and and then I. I take a fragment of it and, and it's the fragment that actually works. It's not the whole picture. And I think often with things like that, you know, it's, it's, you know, that my paintings with, you know, a pear and grapes or a couple of pears and grapes have sort of turned into mini genres, but they were off takes from much more complicated pictures. So I'm always tending towards com complication, you know? You know what I find interesting about this? It would make a great color assignment for a student because you've you know you've got bananas that we all know are yellow the pear 
they can be yellow, but they're not the same yellow as a banana. And then we got grapes that are very pale green. And yet it almost feels like a monochromatic painting because all of the lights, your highlights are bright yellow. And yet, but the half tones and reflected or and secondary lights or on this, the light side on this that's lit from the soft light reveals the actual local color of each of the objects in a very subtle very subtle way so it still feels like green grapes and the bananas and pears feel slightly different yellow even though all of their lights are the same like lemon yellow tone well the, in terms of the palace in the picture like that it's, it's basically cadmium you know I guess yeah. the 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 plinth that they're on it requires earth colors, I think, or or I paint them with earth colors. But beyond that, it's black, white, and cadmiums. You know, cadmium red, cadmium orange, and and cadmium yellow, and probably like two of each. So there are two cadmium reds, two cadmium oranges, two cadmium yellows, and the 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 green, the the appearance of green is just cadmium orange and black, or cadmium yellow and black. Um, so it's quite a restricted palette. Yeah. But you see what I'm saying though? Like you've got green, this is black and yellow, obviously green here, you've got green here and you've got green here. And yet we still, I still read these as green grapes and this as yellow bananas. And maybe that's actually what mm -hmm. I'm bringing to the painting more than a color study. I, I just find that interesting about this, about this, the color, how it's, it's reading as correct. And yet they're sharing the exact same palette. Yeah. It's fascinating and really well done. Um, all right. Let's just look at, I want to go back to your Instagram and look at one more piece because I've always been interested in your bread still lifes. They are just too cool. Um, and you've done quite a few of these. And what is it about bread that you find interesting? Um, well, a lot of what I do is very complicated, you know, and it's, and it's very, you know, I, I tend to overthink and get overwrought and try to invest my work with, with, you know, too much thought and concept or, you know, I don't know whether it's too much or not. But I need a break, you know, and uh, I, I tend to oscillate between pictures that are uh, very uh, complicated, sort of compositionally sophisticated, loaded with meaning, loaded with concept, and 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 then doing going to the opposite extreme, basically, and trying to paint as simple a picture as I can. And the simplest pictures that I came up with were just like, okay, I'll paint a loaf of bread. And they were a little bit, they, they were sort of modeled on the odd nerd from brick. Uh, but I, I wanted, you know, and, and just the, 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 the sort of the, the, the frontality, the almost brutality of it. Here it is, you know, sort of approach to still life. Um, but I wanted to make it, you know, a little bit more of a generous offering than the brick. So, like bread is something that basically I think I think almost everyone loves. You know, even the even the gluten intolerant people love bread and just lament that they can't eat it. So we all love bread, and you know, a loaf of bread in itself. You know, especially like if you get a nice baked. Like it just doesn't really matter. You know, a sliced pan from the in the supermarket is, it will work too. But you've got all these textures. You know, from the top to the bottom and the crustiness and. Um, and, and it's, it's an object that, you know, it's basically, it, it can be close to monochrome. It's basically brown, but you can get really into the surface and the texture and it'd be quite gratifying. But the, the, the overall aesthetic with these sort of pictures, I tried to just present them like gifts, you know, like here it is, here's something to be thankful for, essentially. Here's something nourishing and nutritious and um you know uncomplicated it's not going to have an argument with you um and uh and i ca and i've called these you know my bread and butter pictures and at, at times they they have been my bread and butter um you know i i i 
my very complicated, large scale, ambitious pictures don't always sell easily. And I tend to, uh, you know, my economic model is to balance these sort of large scale, ambitious, long term projects with small pictures that I can produce relatively easily and that can sell relatively easily because they don't cause people major intellectual problems. They can just appreciate them, you know, in terms of their sensuality. Uh, so th that's, that's how I've sort of found my own balance as an artist. And, and I've also, I did, did, there's a, a contrast, like where I do my, you know, which you might call my orange paintings, where the color symbolism is very much, you know, apocalyptic, Trumpian, end of the world, hell, hell and damnation, you know, nuclear weapons going off or whatever, you know, all, all of that sort of thing. And it's very warm and it's very orange. And I've taken that to an extreme. Uh, I try to, to go to the other extreme and do something that's just so cool, you know, it's just so cool and calm and, and, uh, fresh and meditative. And I try to get that atmosphere in the picture that it's just really fresh and cool and and restful so those are the values i'm trying to imbue the picture with and 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 almost you know take to you know it's, it's almost like taking to an extreme where it's like well i know what i'm doing here you know it's like well i'm, I'm being uber cool to the point that it's it almost becomes a statement in itself you know of, of uh um how tasteful can you be this is this is where I where I think I'm really trying to be tasteful mm -hmm. as a painter, you know. Hmm. Um, almost ironically, like look at this picture; it's just so tasteful, you know. <laughs> oh man, you know what's interesting about your work, though? I look at this, and I shouldn't recognize it as your work when I look at the Putin one with the sitting on the bomb, but somehow it still looks like your work, and it's so different, and I can't quite put my finger on it, but. Regardless, the fact that I can't define it is maybe even a better thing because it's not something that's sort of kitchen, like a little trick you're doing. It's something much deeper than that. But congrats to you for staying cohesive, even when you're, you're spanning a huge range in subject matter and composition and color palette and so on. Well, thank you. That's nice to hear. I, I, I am conscious that I, I'm tending towards you know, fragmentation as an artist in terms of the range that I want to cover and all the different types of things that I want to do. And, and I suppose the only thing, like it, what what holds it together at the end is a sort of, you know, it's like calligraphy, you know, it's like a handwriting that it's, it's, it's yours no matter what you do, you know, no matter what you write, you'll still write with, with your handwriting and your calligraphy. And, and you develop a, a mode of, paint application that in some level is intuitive and some level it carries over. And I do, like th these pictures inform and enhance my big figure paintings, you know. I've learned so much by doing small, fast pictures, which I then apply to the big ones mm. um, in, in terms of, you know, what I want to make look, you know, what, what should satisfy as a surface, you know, uh, the, the great thing about still life is that it, you, you've got the thing in front of you and you have to work directly and, or you can't, you, at least you can work directly and you get this very sort of in, intuitive, spontaneous approach to handling the, 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 the paint, which if you just did big ambitious figure painting, uh, you wouldn't, you'd, you'd never develop that. And, and the danger with people who set themselves to do the big ambitious figure paintings is that they, they, they are always less than the sum of their parts, you know? And, and, and I, and I, I was, I, I started off, I wanted to be a big ambitious figure painter to start with, you know? Uh, uh but the, those early efforts, always tended to end up a bit of a little bit of, 
you know, they weren't very painterly. So finding a way to be um, painterly in everything I do, uh, you know, working on small, modest pictures has really helped um, in in the transfer of um, technical skills and just a sense of the the how paint, you know, what I want to communicate with paint through the surface. I'm glad you said that. That's uh, I've learned a ton from talking to you, but that right there is something I'm gonna try and implement more because I'm one of those artists that tries to do big, ambitious paintings too much. Like, and I feel like ex sometimes I feel like my paintings are nothing more than a sum of their parts. You know, look, I can paint this part well, and I can paint that part well, but it's so hard to put it all together. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, but that's not true. And your compositions are, are amazing. I, I, I remember, I think it was it was soon after I joined Facebook, uh, and and watching uh, that that amazing um, uh, biblical uh, painting that you did. That 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 the the, um, the, the, the Christ on the donkey. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, with the with the crowd scene all around, and like watching that happen over time, and watching you pull that to to completion piece by piece, it was really fascinating watching that. Oh, but, thanks. You, know, you, you certainly, you, they're, they're certainly, uh, you know, very um, very impressive and 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 very accomplished. And then that like, gives to life pictures are just so complicated as, as well you know and they, yeah. they're amazing but oh you, thank you like, i i thought i was i thought i was bad in terms of chucking the kitchen sink into the picture you know like a, <laughs> wow you know it's like everything you know everything you could yeah, find that's funny <laughs> Yeah, but nonetheless, I appreciate that. I, but you know how it is. Like you said, you don't like your own work. It's the same. I think all. I think most of us are that way, where we we can't appreciate our own stuff. But let me. Well, let me ask you one final question. If you could give one piece of advice uh, to an artist that that wants to follow in your footsteps, and, and not you in particular, but be a professional artist, what piece of advice would that be? Um. I would say don't get don't get caught up about technique. I think there 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 are too many people who get really insecure about their their their, their technique, and they're all they go get all worried about the secret formulas, the old masters, and all of that. And and that's not important. The other thing I'd say is, and I think it's really important for artists today, is read, educate yourself widely. Because if you don't, you won't have anything of interest to say. You know, I think that's that, that, that is the most important thing. It's important to have well informed opinions and views and strong views. And uh, and you need to take an interest in the world and inform yourself and it, you know, treat it as a ten or twenty year project. You know, like you you anyone coming along today you know it's back in the renaissance you could have painters who only had to really w work with the technical end of painting because other people told them what to paint and other people took care of the iconography the philosophy the the subject matter all of this was was done by scholars who, or, or or humanists who basically said hey painter this is what I want you to paint, and and this is what you do. And most painters followed that model, and they were craftsmen, primarily, but they were not intellectuals. Uh, today, being an artist is a different matter. No one will tell you what to paint. Um, no one will tell you what to do. You need to work it out yourself, and you need to work it out from the bottom up and the top down. So you need uh, a subject, you need a viewpoint, you need to basically take on what's been done, know the history, know the craft, and uh, insofar as you can, um, you know, acquaint yourself with Western, or, you know, if, if, you're, if, if, you, if you're a Westerner, let's say, acquaint yourself with Western civilization. 
uh, or if you consider yourself a citizen of the world, acquaint yourself with global civilization. But it's not that hard to cover the last 6,000 years of civilization, more or less. You know, you can take it on. I, you know, Greek and Roman literature doesn't amount to a huge amount if you set out to read it all. You know, uh, the, the, the classics don't amount to, you know, you can read them all in 10, 20 years. And if you do that, you'll be a fully educated person and you might be worth listening to. So I would say set out to be someone who is worth listening to. Set out to embody wisdom in your work so that if people pay attention to, the, to your work, you'll have a bit of depth uh, and it won't be just a pretty surface. What do you paint before that 20 years of reading is up? What do you paint on year one? <laughs> well, you don't stop painting. Right, right. You know, but, but uh, the, you don't necessarily expect to be a mature artist mm -hmm. until you're 40. I'd say that should be the expectation. And, and, and that's not unusual. I think painting is a, 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 an art form that takes a long apprenticeship and, 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 and you will mature slowly and you will, you can expect to come, uh, to your peak in your forties and then decline. Oh, don't tell me that I'm expect, 48. <laughs> you, know, you have to expect the decline. We're like athletes, you know, we peak at, you know, maximum uh, brain power, maximum uh, stamina. And, and after that, you really have to husband your resources to do anything. Uh, but uh, that, that's, you know, that, that, that is the, 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 the reality. You have to aim to pull everything together at a certain point, hope, hopefully not too late. But painters shouldn't, like in, in music, it's a different story. In, in, in music, most achievement happens uh, in, with, with musicians in their teens and 20s. And it doesn't matter whether they're pop musicians or uh, classical musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, Mozart, Beethoven, all of these, they were producing masterpieces in their, in their teenage years. And they were, th those masterpieces are absolute masterpieces for all time. And yeah, the Beatles were young too. And, and, and all of the greats uh, showed their true promise uh, in music fairly early. But uh, I think painting is a much longer game. You need to uh, learn to come to terms with visible nature, which takes time. And you need to come to terms with what it means to be human uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. And it takes time. And I, I'd say consider it as a 20,000 hour, 30,000 hour project. That was brilliant. I really appreciate that. You know, in all I've done, I don't know how many podcasts now, 35 or something. And I have never heard that piece of advice. So that's great. I really appreciate that. And it's been an honor to have you on the podcast. It's been a real treat. I really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. It's, it's been great to chat and, um, you know, uh, say, to, say hello to everyone in Utah for me. I've never been to Utah. But I'll, I'll do that. Get there someday. I'll do that and say hello to everyone in England. I mean, I'm sorry, Ireland. <laughs> bold. <laughs> very, very bold. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.